Yeah. Okay, so we should all see everything. I have four different monitors right now. So I just wanna make sure you actually are seeing just the PowerPoint, thank you. Okay, so let's start off with, uh, as we always do, just a reminder of where we're going to go tonight. Um, welcoming any new members. I don't notice there's any new names. Bonnie has joined us in the past before, and Charm's always been so wonderful to invite our family along. Um, is there anyone else that might be a new member? And I wish to say hello. I didn't recognize any new names. So moving on, we'll talk about things that we might be seeing, um, some identification challenges. I picked relatively easy things this week, I hope. Uh, things going on with the committee, a field trip that's coming up this weekend, and then any discussion points that we want to make before we have our wonderful presentation um, for March. So for bird sightings, this is a wonderful time to share things that you might have been seeing. Some of you know that I took my spring break and instead of going to Florida, which I was planning on doing, I headed the opposite way to spend 20 degree weather looking for the stellar sea eagle on a bridge in Maine. Um, so I did get to see it after four days of freezing weather and um, crying a lot on the bridge became very religious, asking God for the favor to see the bird eventually, but I did. And then I also got to travel around and that's where I got to see this nice little eider that was sitting out and about. So what wonderful things have we all been seeing um, since our last meeting? This is Gwen and Walter, and we have been watching two white-breasted nuthatches examine one of our bird boxes. It appears that they are going to move in. Oh, how oh, cool. I saw two bluebirds for the first time ever in my yard. Um, there's not much open space around, but I had some mealworms and some bark butter bits in a little dish and they went crazy and then they were gone again. <laughs> I had our first male Bullock's uh, Oriole in the backyard at the feeder a day ago. I had heard the female and saw her, but I hadn't seen the males yet. So they, they come into San Diego uh, about this time each year. They're beautiful. Speaking of Orioles, I have a friend here in Richmond who has for the last three winters has had a Baltimore Oriole Mm -hmm. uh, three winners that showed up ago as a first year male. Um, it's been in its adult plumage the last two years. And this year, a second um, hatch year plumage bird uh, has shown up with it. So they actually have the adult male and another um, uh, hatch year male uh, hanging out both um, there here in Richmond. Oh, that's awesome. Anyone else seeing really cool things? Everyone's making me jealous. I thought it was good with my eagle, but you're seeing a lot of well, cool I behavior. Mean, nothing, nothing tops stellar sea eagle. That's for sure. Yeah. That's uh, maybe the rarest bird North America's ever had, in, well. as far as vagrants go. But uh, I have the added benefit of being out on the boat every day for work. But at the fort, there are a few razor bills swimming oh. around and flying about. So it's a good time to hang out at the seawall at Fort Monroe and you might catch them floating around or flying around uh, out there. And there's a long tailed duck that's hanging out as well. Um, so I guess our four dozen vultures in the park don't count. <laughs> Everyone loves vultures for sure. Quantity, not quality. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean, it's probably not new to most folks, but I am seeing the, uh, the ospreys coming back to their nesting sites last couple of weeks. Yeah, we have very busy Bewick's wrens that are kind of here all year round. They're, uh, they have a lot of different calls <laughs> and we have a pair, so. And speaking of raptors, there's a, I've got a pair of uh, great horned owls that have been mm -hmm. uh, hooting up a, a, a bunch in the last couple of days right behind the house. So they're pretty active right now. Yeah, the new place we have some that are, you know, everyone's trying to make babies right now. Those already started babies right now, depending who you are with 
um, some eagles and the osprey are building a nest. The uh, osprey on campus have found a new spot to sit near my building, but they keep dropping fish parts <laughs> over the sidewalk. Of course they do. I keep looking and hoping that they'll drop them on students because I think that would be funny, but um, they haven't done that yet. But anyone else seeing some other great, you know, early springtime behaviors or birds? Um, Eric and I um, were walking out at Sa um, Sandy Bottom, and I'm pretty sure we saw some buffle heads out on the lake. I'm pretty sure they were buffle heads. Um, yeah, that's good. That and I have a yellow rump warbler who Me I too. think he comes every year. He, I don't think he gets a mate and, and nests in the year, but he delights in chasing my Carolina chickadees. He will not let them close to the feeder. Someone has to keep those little birds in check. I've oh, seen yellow rumps in the yard the last couple of days as well. Uh, and they're feeding on the Oriole feeder. I didn't know that they did that. Usually they're on the suet. <clears throat> we have Adams and Allen's hummingbirds. And of course the uh, sugar water goes down a lot more at this time of year. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it's very, very cool. They're very cool. Scrappy little things. <laughs> All right, so if nothing else, let's move on to our few identification challenges. All should be easy, but I do try to put one sneaky one in, but because of the wonderful field trip that has been planned for this weekend, my selection has been with waterfowl. So I know our speaker last week talked about waterfowl. We have some identification challenges about waterfowl because they're going to mostly leave us in coming weeks. So what about this first uh, image? So someone in the chat put buffle head, and it is a buffle head. I try to be a little bit tricky because she's diving, and so her head doesn't look as round as we typically think about buffle heads because she's going in for that nice dive. Uh, next bird. Better ready? I know it's hard to tell scale, but it's a good bit bigger than a, a ready. But that's a really good you know, color comparison, pattern comparison. So that's a female black scoter. Uh, this was actually at the fort. The buffalo head was also at the fort um, earlier this year. And I gave you some things. One of the big things is that cap and that really nice, clear, whitish cheek and neck that helps us separate. And of course, if you saw them and you had some scalability opposed to the photo, you would easily see that's a rather largish, biggish of our waterfowl. I don't know why that's playing a song. I think because I used this slide the other time. So there's a warbler song that I've impregnated with the slide. That bird does not make that sound. But this should be the easiest one that we um, have tonight. Uh, white wing scoter. White wing scoter. When I like scoters. I, I must have a scoter fetish. I just think they're cool birds that are out and about. And then finally, a little bit of a challenge. Spotted pot belly diving duck. <laughs> I like the spotted pot belly diving duck. We also had gadwall in two gadwalls in the um, chat. Let's see if I help you by showing you the head of the same bird. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we're all now thinking blue wing teal. And I sometimes you don't think about it because the identification characters that you look at, that head, that white stripe along the front anterior portion, blue wing teal. But I think if sometimes we just take a step back and study the bird a little bit more, you really perhaps never notice how beautiful that um, spotted patterning is of their, their contour feathers on their body, which I you know, thought was really pretty 
So needs a name change. Yeah. Spot belly, no, spot pot belly diving duck. <laughs> so let's check in with our committees. Gwen, I don't think there's anyone new, but I don't want to take away your fire. Go ahead. I'm fine. Okay. And I know Jane and Diane um, have been doing a lot. Jane has been doing stuff with the um, walks. And if you weren't aware, on the Facebook page, I post an article that talked about the um, walks that Jane has been leading at Newport News Park. So if you wanted to check that out, you can head over to the Facebook page and get a link to that. I think it's from the Chesapeake Journal or the Journal of the Chesapeake Bay or something. So it was nice talking about the club and things that we're doing there. I didn't notice Tom, but that doesn't mean he's not here. Tom, are you here this evening? Yes, oh, you are. I, yes, I'm, I, I'm here. You can hear my voice, I think. Uh, yes, yes. And uh, uh, for the uh, newsletter, uh, uh, apologies to photo contest uh, chief uh, Michael Meyer and Pete Peterman, Lynn Chandler, and uh, Laura May, who won the uh, uh, won the photo contest for uh, my uh, uh, <clears throat> underperformance editing uh, uh, of uh, the article on them in the newsletter. But uh, thank you to uh, Bill Bay, James Abbott, uh, John Adair, and Jane Frigo for uh, writing. Uh, uh, the newsletter material. And uh, uh, next uh, newsletter will be coming out in the beginning of May and due date is April 25. Thank you. Great, thanks. And I think that photo contest, I really enjoy getting to see everyone's photos. So I think that was a nice addition to the club that we've started with. COVID. Yes, so, that was your uh, that was your idea, Sean. And it, it's I, really worked out. Yeah, I think it was our ideas, but it has, been really nice because we have some really talented people. So I'm glad we've been doing that. I don't think Michael's here. Well, if he was, he would have said something by now. I didn't see the Maxis. Are they here? I know the web page is being updated. Um, there's some things that they've changed around. Um, so that's all working out well. So we can move on from that. James, I'm going to go to the field next. Um, do check to make sure that I just copied it from the web page. So if there was errors, please let me know. I don't misinform people, but please feel free to tell us what's going to happen. No error, but I'll announce it here and then put the email out. Uh, but we're going to move to Sunday. Saturday is both wet and like 40 mile per hour winds. So even if it's not raining, it's going to be a terrible day to be out. Um, the wind is significantly less on Sunday. So everything's going to stay the same, but we're going to move to Sunday the 13th. And I'll put that email out tonight um, to the club membership list that I have. Um, but if you've ever done this trip before, the Williamsburg Club does something similar. And it's really fun. Basically, we'll rally at the target off of 199. This is stuff of the Marquis Parkway. And we'll kind of caravan down the um, down the parkway, stopping at pull-offs down the York River, down to Yorktown Beach. And it's a really good opportunity to get some of the species of ducks that we tend to miss in some of our other um, trips where we don't quite have the same type of water. So things like canvas backs, things like tundra swan um, should still be um, there. I've actually had, um, if you go out at night right now, um, I've had tundra swans screaming coming over the last couple of nights. So um, this is actually the time when we could get a, you know, a big number sitting somewhere over there as, as they're moving back north. So as always, you can text me, call me, uh, send me an email. Um, I like to get an idea of how many people are coming and who, but everything will stay the same except we're moving to Sunday because Saturday's looking terrible. Um, I'm sending emails out to the Army Corps to see if they are going to actually make their decision about Craney in March, like they said they are. So still working on that. Um, and I'll try to have information about this Craney trip as soon as possible, um, whether the Army Corps is going to play ball and allow it. So um, otherwise, I'm looking at some dates in May. It won't be like a formal field trip for the club, but um, 
Ryan and I usually make a couple of trips out to Warbler Road out in the mountains in May. And um, once we know what those are, I'm happy to, you know, let people know if they want to um, join. They've never done Warbler Road and would like to do it with some folks who have done it before. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, James, uh, 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 parking uh, at the pull-offs, or is this going to be more or less impromptu whenever an interesting bird is seen, or or is it going to be in designated lots? Yeah, I've got certain ones that I stop at that I usually have success with. So they are parking lots, yeah. Yeah, the pull-offs on the parkway is plenty of parking. We'll park, get out, set oh, scopes up. Thank you. Thank you very yep. much. And move to Sunday, right. Yep. Thank you. Sunday, Saturdays looks terrible. It's also daylight savings time. Yes. So that, <laughs> that's something to keep track of. Yeah. Um, and James, can you email the Maxi so they can change that on the web page as well? Yeah, I'll put the email out to the club tonight. Great. All right, Bill. I had some stuff about, whoop, I did change the year. I did change the date, but I didn't change the year. But for 2022, Bill, I think I'm right with that. We decided on April 16th. Do you want to say anything about that? No, I think it's a pretty well-known event. Uh, we just moved it up because of the uh, the VSO annual meeting is the 29th. Normally, we would do this on the last Saturday of April, but that's taken. And with uh, the hopefully the potential trip to uh, Craney Island, I wouldn't want to conflict with that. So we'll back it up to Saturday the 16th. So I'll be getting an email out to everybody looking for participants um, within the next day or so. And then okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say one other thing real quick. Um, my report in the newsletter of the Christmas bird count was uh, had an error in it. Uh, the list of participants reflected 2020, not 2021. So I'll provide a corrected copy to Tom so he can put it in uh, the April newsletter. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, great. I mean, thank everyone for who helps. We have a really strong club, and it's really nice to know that so many people are always pushing forward and always coming to occasions for Christmas or now the spring uh, bird count that we'll see everyone at. Um, Bill gave us a map before. I just kept this from last year. So things to look out for. Um, so we're going to shift to having hybrid meetings in April and May. We'll still have a Zoom component, um, but the speakers will be able to um, chat, um, do Zoom, and then also have it be presented while we meet at Sandy Bottom. Um, do note we're being very cautious about things. The plan is um, if you wish to partake in some snacks, we'll do that. We'll try to meet outside on the veranda a little bit more, the patio before coming inside so we have more air amongst us and we're not just in the confines of that room. I know a number of members might not wish to do this. A lot of members have been aching for it really badly. So again, don't feel safe. Zoom is for you. If you feel you're boosted, you're healthy, you're not questionable, come join us. We'll talk outside and go inside. I think April, we're going to have our um, young scientists from CNU that we are supporting as a club come and talk about her research about grassland birds. So that should be a wonderful time. Um, I know Pete wants me and uh, we've also been contacted from the VSO about meeting with them, um, potentially to talk about things that the club could get more involved with or what the club might like to see the VSO do. Um, I've taken a little bit of Liberty with some of that, given I'm at an HBCU, so I talked a little bit about being a little bit more open and how we can get BIPOC uh, populations involved with um, birding, but that's a side thing, but they, they want to hear from the club. So if you want to add some comments you want me to convey, or if you want to be part of, I think potentially a Zoom meeting or meeting them out at the Great Dismal Swamp, um, let me know so I can loop you into all those things or take those comments um, with us, but I think the VSO is doing a wonderful job and we've all enjoyed that. And I also want to plant the idea that there are elections coming up and I will need two people to help lead those because in our bylaws, um, and it makes sense, I can't 
do the elections and run in the elections or anyone else. So if you're trying to run or your board member, um, it's kind of a conflict of interest. So I need some people that are outside of that world just to uh, take some announcements, say who the nominations are. If you don't want to be um, fulfilling this uh, role that you currently have, you can start to communicate those ideas with me and we will have an announcement at next meeting. We'll have vote in May and those persons who are helping to run this will announce it at that time. And then we will instill new officers or perhaps our old officers that are gluttons for punishment for the next year in our um, June picnic. So um, put those things in the back of your mind. Does anyone have any general announcements before we move on this evening? All right, hearing none, I would like to uh, welcome our speaker for this evening, a naturalist, a birder, an extraordinary, um, wonderful photographer. His images not just capture what the bird is, but behavior and ecology with each shot. I first got to hear him talk about his water feature when I was visiting the Williamsburg Bird Club, probably six years ago now when we first moved here. Um, so Bob Shammerhorn is going to share with us his experience, his photographs, and again, get us in this mood thinking about springtime for um, warblers. And Bob, you should now be a co-host and have all the rights privileges there on too. All right. Hopefully you see a warbler by now. Very good. Everyone see that? Okay, excellent. Let's open a little bit. All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's um, great to be back uh, with the group again, too. This is um, just a really uh, special group of birds. And uh, if nothing else, I hope you'll find um, a little bit of beauty in them. Uh, a little refreshment um, too with uh, this is you know always that exciting time of year that um, uh, these birds are going to push through our area and so if nothing else maybe a bit of a just a refresher course uh, for what's getting ready to happen um, you know in just um, you know about a month here uh, these birds will be pushing through and so um, uh, this group is, is um, not just spectacular uh, in so many ways, but certainly, uh, if nothing else, um, in their color uh, and in their variety um, as well. This is a group of uh, birds that covers nearly three dozen species that we um, either have um, uh, really just one of them all the time, a uh, couple that are hang around in the winter, uh, but others um, that show up during the breeding season and then a large group that pushes through heading north. Um, this of course is the yellow warbler. Um, these do nest in Virginia. They prefer uh, box elder trees to nest in. Um, this is a beautiful spring male, pretty much yellow from head to toe, pretty evenly except for those uh, delicate racing stripes uh, down his breast. Uh, and as all the warblers, you know, one of the great challenges for most of us as birders is learning all those three dozen different songs uh, to help differentiate them when you're out in the field. And, and it really is these mnemonic devices go a tremendous way um, to identifying them, to figure out which sound you wanna follow, uh, just as in the rest of uh, any bird watching endeavor uh, is a great tool. Um, you know, the yellow warbler, sweet, sweet, little bit of sweet, uh, very rhythmic. And so you'll see as we go through the program, uh, as this video is, um, uh, ones that are um, at the uh, bird map that was uh, mentioned before too. Um, this is a, um, uh, a great um, uh, advantage to have a dripping water. Um, it's one of the things that attract these birds in particular on their migration route. Uh, they can readily use the water too. Um, here's a fall yellow warbler. Uh, this was taken out of Kip to Peak along the coastal zone. And so of all these um, 
uh, different birds. Another thing it adds to the confusion are some of them change color a bit in the fall. Some of them are change a whole lot in their fall plumage and their non-breeding plumage. Others um, stay the same all year long. Uh, the prothonotary is one of those. Uh, these love the wet woodland areas uh, along um, uh, river banks uh, where trees um, have their feet in the water is always uh, a sign of a good habitat for this bird. Beautiful silvery uh, gray wings um, with just an intense yellow. Uh, photography wise, these are challenging birds to photograph because the yellow is so intense it tends to overexpose uh, quite easily. Um, even when you're uh, compensating uh, for that condition. Um, yellow is one of the strongest uh, reflective colors um, in the spectrum that uh, most digital cameras perceive. But once again, a very even tone song without raising in tone or lowering tone. Um, these birds are breeding season only birds here uh, throughout Virginia and their first landing has some uh, there we have um, uh, quite an extensive um, bunch of them here. Uh, they run a 1500 mile um, uh, migration southward to um, uh, southern Central America, northern um, South America zone uh, around Panama or so is a, is a central point, I guess, um, down and back traversing uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, each way. Another and one of our smaller, uh, delicate little um, warblers, the parula. Um, so sometimes these birds, as they're migrating, are in small flocks. Uh, I just saw a friend uh, sent me a picture the other day uh, from his uh, home in Wisconsin, uh, and he had about seven Tennessee warblers uh, all at once. This is a group of about seven or eight northern parulas. Um, the northern parallel has this broken eye ring is a good ID mark, very strong wing bars, that olive green patch on their back, along with the um, a little bit of rust dashing the yellow uh, on their bellies as well. Very fine beak on this bird, uh, just well adapted for picking uh, the little tiny caterpillars that emerge um, as the leaves begin to unfold on the trees. and. Um, uh, these are part of what fuels their migration um, as they move northward. Um, notice that rising tone getting quicker and quicker um, as it goes up. Almost like an out of control wind up toy. In that little bit of snap at the end is another um, a good ID for that audio. Uh, for this little bird. Uh, here's a nice spring male here. Uh, notice the uh, darkness there across his face. So it's wonderful to have this density of birds that, that push through. Um, as they uh, migrate, they're coming through at night at high altitudes, um, cruising along uh, as uh, long as they can uh, make it during the night to cover that distance. Uh, then they will uh, look for a green patch uh, as the sun rises. Uh, typically, once they find that resting location, they stay two or three days often uh, to refuel eating caterpillars. Uh, taking care of their wings. Um, here's the blue wing warbler. Um, these nest along the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains and uh, open scrubby areas. Note the two tone bees buzz. Much like an inhale and an exhale. Now this is probably a uh, first year uh, male and uh, as they get older their faces get a little bit blacker um, in there as well. Uh, this was on a spring migration day. We actually had, you know, I'm on the north side of Richmond in suburban habitat uh, on a third of an acre lot with a thousand other third of an acre lots around me. But even one spring we had four uh, 
blue wing warblers in our yard all at one time. So the push of birds through is the wave is quite dense. Uh, the golden wing warbler, another um, uh, upper elevational bird uh, of the western um, uh, mountain ranges. Quite distinct patch, you see where it gets its name from. It's a very similar sounding song, but with four syllables to it, sometimes three, but typically always more than the two of the blue wing. And then those two species um, do enter uh, hybridize, um, and they call that the Brewster's uh, warbler when it looks like this. Uh, this may even be uh, a Brewster's mix um, with a golden wing also. So you get a little variety in their uh, plumages between those two species. Uh, this is also actually a Brewster's, but primarily towards much more leaning towards the golden wing side. Uh, going to feed its young nesting on the ground. You may have seen this in Virginia Wildlife Magazine a couple years ago. So the prairie warbler, here's another uh, very habitat specific bird. Uh, when I see, you know, an open scrubby field with uh, young long needle pines, um, in the six to eight foot range scattered across it, I can always pull over and expect to hear this um, song of this bird with this rising buzzy sound. Very even in the, in the uh, notes from one to the other. None of them are closer together, they're very even, uh, but rising as it goes. the striping there along its ribs, the little um, dash across its eye and down its um, uh, cheek there. Very distinct in plumage. But a very habitat specific bird. Um, uh, it does prefer, part of that reason is the uh, caterpillars that are um, indicative of the uh, uh, long needle pines. The pine warblers also enjoy those same uh, insects. Uh, the yellow-breasted chat is um, an interesting bird. It's often been a, a dilemma whether it's grouped uh, with the warblers as the largest warbler, uh, just depending on uh, uh, where we are in, in uh, the age of science as to which, uh, uh, whether it belongs to that group or if it's in a uh, kind of standalone of its own. Uh, but it's certainly one that comes into the area during uh, spring migration to nest for the year. Very odd mixture of different um, vocalizations, often broken. And back to the little warblers. So here's the Nashville warbler. Once again, a very distinct song. Full eye ring on this bird, the grayish head. Uh, the yellow is actually a very olivey tone. So here he is in the fall, uh, much duller plumage to him. See bit, see bit, see bit, see, 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 see. And of course, if you got Nashville, you got to have the Tennessee. So also a fairly long call with sort of a double noted front and the last few notes tend to be singular. And along the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, just to the west, uh, the chestnut side of warblers come in. They do breed in Virginia at about a little over 2,000 feet in altitude and up. Of course, that distinct uh, golden cap on them. Uh, this was another bird we had uh, last year at spring migration. Um, uh, we had two distinct uh, adult males. Uh, this was one of them. Please, please, please to meet you.
So this is one that was taken uh, in the Shenandoah. So Skyline Drive, you would have these. Uh, Warbler Road, if you go up there in the spring, you would have these as well. So another bird that reminds me a lot of the uh, chestnut side of its call uh, is the Magnolia Warbler. It seems a very similar call, but it's hurried up. It's almost like the please, please, please to meet you, but it's much quicker. And one of the trickiest things about the songs of all these birds is that uh, they vary their calls uh, in some species. Some do it much more than others. Uh, others uh, stick pretty distinctly to only one or two calls. Um, uh, the uh, magnolia uh, does have some variance in it, uh, nowhere near as much as others like the American red star, probably the uh, most variant of them all. So here's a female in uh, fall plumage. Uh, and these birds have a very distinct color of yellow uh, that um, does not seem to be in any of the other species. Uh, uh, I'm, I've been, I've worked for a long time in color matching and stuff. And uh, this shade of yellow just doesn't seem to uh, be on any of the other warblers. Um, it's uh, a very true sort of yellow, maybe a, a hint to the green side without being olivey. Uh, but such a pure yellow color to it. It's almost distinct without seeing the rest of the bird. Um, so the magnolia was named, given its name um, uh, by uh, back in the days in the 1800s when they were finding new species still. Alexander Wilson was one of those guys out searching for him. The Wilson's warbler is named for him. He also named the magnolia warbler because it was first discovered in a magnolia tree. So here's the Wilson's warbler. Chippy, 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 chip, chip, chip. That black cap, of course, being a very distinct um, ID mark for this bird, pretty much uh, completely yellow throughout the rest of its body, uh, except for that striking black cap. The Cape May warblers are quite interesting. Uh, I've seen them several times uh, in fall uh, migrations. <clears throat> Excuse me, they were one of the first uh, visitors to uh, the bird spa uh, as a fall migrant. And um, uh, as I was saying before, we had this gorgeous male um, this past spring that really just put on a show for us. Just I never have seen such clarity in this bird with that brilliant one big striking uh, wing bar there, uh, the chestnut there on his face patch. And this bird has super fine streaking to it. It's one ID, no matter what plumage it's in. Um, look how fine those little streaks are. And this is a, a female in the fall, uh, much duller compared to their other plumage and certainly much more than the male, um, but quite interesting in how fine that streaking is down their breast. Um, without any other ID or song at all, uh, I've gotten where I can identify that bird just by the striping on its belly. Uh, and it's so fine. Uh, the black throated blue, just an absolutely gorgeous bird. It's one of those birds that's just so beautiful. It's hard to believe they, we, we're so blessed to have these with us. Uh, that little um, white triangle there, that little um, handkerchief there on its uh, wing is a, uh, it sets it apart from all the other warblers. It's the only one that has that little um, check mark there, that little um, uh, triangle there on its wing. Beer, 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 B, with the last note being very different, rising in tone and very raspy. Probably one of the earlier uh, warbler calls along with the yellow that I learned. So this is one of those species that does not change plumage at all. He remains uh, this beautiful all year round. And I think the females of this species are also quite striking. This beautiful sort of uh, buffy, almost turquoisey um, uh, coloration that they have is quite striking. A little half broken eye ring there under its eye and a light stripe over its eye as well. Uh, very, very buffy breast on these birds. 
quite distinct from the males. However, they do have that same little mark there on their wings uh, that really makes them easy to identify despite their sort of odd appearance uh, compared to the males, uh, as well as really separating from other uh, females as well. The black-throated green, beautiful gold face patch on these birds. Two distinct calls. Z, 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 Z. And the other is trees, trees, murmuring trees. And so here's some of that variant coming into play between the two of them. But two songs to one bird. But really out of those two songs, they, they are quite steady with those two, um, despite the variance of having two songs compared to some of the others that only have one. So here's a female here. The males have that much richer black uh, down their ribs there along there, just underneath, underneath the edge of their wing. Um, somewhat of a wing bar, not super strong, but definitely there. Uh, that gold face patch that it really carries out uh, in both the males and the females. Uh, here's the male in the spring. So here you can really see how much darker the black is. It carries all the way up uh, under his throat, uh, down his ribs. So this is, of course, also a migratory bird um, as it's passing through. Uh, typically, when I see these birds like this, they are almost never drink. Uh, they get a lot of moisture in their diets because they eat a lot of those little caterpillars uh, that are quite juicy. Um, uh, so they're utilizing the water to maintain their feathers for flight to keep them in good, uh, proper working order while they're on migration. They want to be uh, efficient. Uh, in their use of energy as they can, as they head northward, uh, these birds would breed, you know, up along the U.S. Canadian border and northward uh, into the boreal forest. The yellow-throated warblers are typically one of the earlier ones to arrive in the area. Notice the descending uh, tone of this bird, sort of spiraling down. Quite distinct, well-named bird with that yellow patch all the way down. And every spring, the yellow rumps uh, push through. Uh, these are uh, notorious in their fall plumage, you know, as they push along the coastal zone. Um, but one of the earlier birds that comes into um, well-named bird as well for this uh, yellow patch here at the uh, base of their tail where the rump area, um, they have a two-tone two call, usually either a lower tone and a rising tone, very warbly or reversed, high then low or low then high, but almost always a two-part note uh, despite that variant with a very warbly tone to it. So they also have this little yellow patch at the top of their head. They can actually open that and raise it up just like a kinglet does. So here's a nice spring male that's come down to the bird bath. You can see they get excited um, at the water. He's got his crest opened up now and is spread it open. So I typically get anywhere from a dozen of these almost every spring. Uh, they literally take the longest bird bath of any species I have ever seen. Uh, I have some video segments I've captured that are over three minutes long. Most birds are like 10 seconds is, is a decent amount. You know? uh, most are shorter than that. So it's quite interesting. 
So he's uh, uh, running the water through his wing feathers, uh, making sure they're nice and clean and uh, ready for uh, another flight. This is another species that, so here's one that we have here in the winter time. Uh, I have one now showing up that occasionally picks uh, some of the suet off the uh, platform feeder. Um, here's a female here, not quite as gray, a little bit browner uh, on her back. And so a lot of these warbler close-ups are ones that are coming down to uh, the bird spa. Uh, uh, hitting a few perches, they tend to stair step down out of the upper canopy to the water. So here's this uh, another bird that changes its plumage. Um, as we well know, this bird in the uh, fall and winter when they're in their non-breeding season, once again, that um, uh, yellow rump area there, a great ID mark for this, pretty easy to see that most of the time. And so they're one of our very few uh, winter uh, resident warblers. Uh, here he is in the winter time. Much browner, almost um, uh, just a very dull sort of brown to these birds. A little bit of streaking still, just like in their breeding plumage. Uh, that rump patch always um, carries through on both uh, plumages, however. And the black burning warbler. Uh, I don't know what it is about this species. It's always been one of my favorites. I remember hearing them uh, in my youth up on the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains. I uh, grew up in Lynchburg and lived in Bedford County. I had a view of the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains right out of my back door for a couple decades while I was there and just uh, 45 minutes and I could be up on the mountaintop. Uh, this is a great call to learn. It almost always ends with a super high pitch note. No matter what the beginning part of it is, it has that, it's almost ascending so sharp that it, it, I always think of it as going out of my hearing range. Very, very sharp uh, tone to this bird's call and absolutely a beautiful uh, example of the warbler family as well. Uh, going from that deep burnt orange um, down his uh, face, turning yellower and yellower uh, melting down to white as if he was airbrushed. Um, step two, this is a beautiful male I had a few years ago that uh, was one of my favorite um, Blackburnian photographs ever. Uh, it eventually uh, became the cover for my DVD um, uh, on the bird bath uh, and stuff too. Uh, it's been kind of a, a, an odd uh, uh, time for DVDs because most people don't have a DVD player anymore. So with the download and uh, streaming uh, generations. So here's the female uh, Blackburnian uh, stuff too. One I've uh, rarely seen just loose. Uh, this is one that it came into the bird bath as well. Uh, but I had rarely ever seen one just out in the wild because typically I'm seeing the males because they're singing and I follow their tone, their call uh, when I know what it is. So it's, it's much easier to see the males uh, of many of these birds. Uh, the cerulean is another upper elevational bird, another one that's um, struggling uh, population-wise. Uh, this is um, one you would find in the up on Warbler Road uh, during migration as well, um, uh, as well as into uh, the breeding season. The Canada Warbler with this beautiful necklace And their song is very, uh, I always think of it as kind of hoppy, uh, like it's just jumping up and down all over the place, almost like a little squeaky toy. Once again, that beautiful necklace, a great ID mark for this bird, um, easy to identify, quite distinct song with some variant to it but it always has that quality. So after years in the field, it's, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm finally, you know, starting to learn, you know, that it's almost important to understand and to remember the tone of these calls as it is the rhythm uh, with so many of them. 
and just another of my favorite warblers. And I know I'm going to probably say that at least 35 more times before we're done, <laughs> since there's about three dozen of them. Uh, but just another, just handsome little guy. Uh, the pine warblers, here's another uh, uh, very um, sort of habitat driven uh, bird that also likes the caterpillars on the uh, pine trees. Those strong wing bars are a great ID mark with that golden head that gets a little duller in the non-breeding plumage. This is a spring male with almost like, you know, if you see, he's almost got a uh, golden eye ring too. They sound a lot like a chipping sparrow. I always have to stop and listen a couple of times with that very even warble. It has it's a very warbly, very even, very, very even uh, tone to it. And so typically when I hear that, I just start looking for the pine tree. That's how habitat specific uh, they tend to be. I'm just, you know, it's like I hear it, I'm just like, okay, where's the pine tree at? Because uh, I know it's got to be here somewhere because that's almost where you're going to find them at. Uh, they do enjoy the caterpillars that like those trees. I believe this was at uh, Falls Cape State Park. So here's our one true year round warbler. Uh, out of all these birds, you know, they're typically just moving through. They're only here for the breeding season or they're just here in the winter, but this guy is here all year round. I've had one coming to my um, uh, picking at some of the fine, uh, really good goldfinch uh, feed uh, this um, past winter. Um, We've had actually two individuals. Uh, I believe one's a male and one's a female. Uh, and uh, uh, Adam, you know, it, intermittently uh, at other times too. Uh, they will pick at suet as well uh, if you have suet out. So a few winters ago, I had this guy. This is an orange crown warbler. Um, it's uh, not a whole lot of change to this bird in the breeding season, but this is his winter plumage. It's a bit duller. Uh, than his regular plumage, but was kind of interesting. He showed up during the winter and um, would come about every two weeks he would show up um, or so. So here's the palm warbler. This is, I believe they call this the Western uh, version or uh, morph with the bright yellow uh, and uh, rusty cap there. The other version is a bit duller. This is a gorgeous um, spring male here. And once again, that yellow is just so intense on this bird. Um, it nearly blows out in the, uh, on the camera sensor. Uh, it's just so intense when the sun hits them. But notice how weak and buzzy his call is. It's almost like he's not putting much effort into it. Their chip note is also fairly distinct and flat. Almost has a sort of soft quality to it. So here he is in this uh, winter plumage. So the black pole warbler is another warbler that keeps its uh, the same plumage all year round. So you only have to learn one plumage for this guy. Um, you know, they have that uh, black dark cap like a chickadee does, obviously quite a different bird with the streaking on its breast and that um, uh, handsome gray and black streaking on their back, a bit of a wing bar uh, on these birds. But the best ID mark um, for these little guys is their orange legs. Their call is a bit like a squeaky break, very high pitched, pretty even all the way through. So here's a nice um, spring bird here, nice clean plumage on him.
and notice that that calls that squeaky brake, almost a wheezy sort of sound to it. And here's the chickadee for comparison. I thought that was very nice. He came in and gave me that comparison shot there. So uh, another very uh, similarly colored uh, warbler is the black and white. Uh, fairly streaky guy uh, all the way down his back with the beautiful black and white, really strong wing bars. Um, pretty much the same plumage all year round as well. Here's a nice spring male here with this striking um, jet black and pure white plumage to him. So I th always thought this was kind of funny. Actually, there's there's the food he should be looking to eat there, uh, creeping along that has fallen out of the tree. <laughs> he accidentally steps on it and it uh, curls around his foot. So this was actually photographed with no blind. I was actually getting ready to leave for uh, the airport to go to Hawaii. And um, uh, I saw this guy out there. They do sort of a wing twittering as they're excited about getting down to the water and stuff. And so I just grabbed my camera and I'm laying in the open grass in my backyard. And he has come down. They have such a desire to get down to the water to clean their feathers. Uh, he allowed me to um, probably at about 12 feet uh, laying in the open with my camera, tripod legs spread open. Uh, at about a foot off the ground. There's something about the sound and movement of the dripping water that is uh, very attractive um, to the warblers in particular, along with many of the other migration birds um, too. Here's a female here, a little less streaking on her, but still quite a, a handsome bird. That wheezy, wheezy, wheezy. Pretty distinct sound as well. So the hooded warbler, here's another uh, uh, bird that loves the um, habitat of a deep deciduous forest. Very rhythmic call to these. Um, here's sort of a close-up shot where you can really um, uh, see that uh, the hood markings on this bird where he gets his name. Wita, wita, wita. This was taken at a bird banding station. My wife Lori does uh, bird banding. Here's the female here. She is the one and only hooded warbler I've had at my uh, bird bath in the backyard. But you can still see that sort of faint um, uh, of her face marking as well as, you know, just that faint uh, bit of uh, a hooding to her, but it's more of an olive green and much more uh, faded. Uh, the morning warbler, another very interesting tone to his call. This would, uh, I believe there's only about one place in Virginia that's on the West Virginia border uh, up in Highland County where you might find this guy. That silvery gray, uh, almost a metallic look to the uh, gray coloration on their head. So three distinct notes with a bit of a mix at the end. But the tone to this is another uh, great example of how just the tone of the call, not even the rhythm, uh, is so important to identifying it uh, by its call. And so of all the warblers, uh, uh, the American Red Star has the greatest variant uh, of all. We sort of, every spring, you know, we're standing there, we're going, what is that? What is that? What is that? And about the third time we say, what is that? We go, oh, it must be a red star because we just said, what is that three times in a row?
So sometimes I have a couple of calls, sometimes I have five or six. Uh, they're different tones, different calls. Um, but overall, it's got it's got that quality that that remains the same throughout. It's almost a certain um, sharpness to it, I guess. So here's the female. So where the male is black and orange, the female is this beautiful buttery yellow uh, and deep gray. Quite a beautiful bird in its own respect. But that sort of tail notching is a great identification mark for these birds. So in behavior, they're very glittery uh, in, around, in the bushes. They hardly ever sit still, it seems. Uh, they do nest um, uh, in Virginia. And once again, you can see that sort of uh, yellow notching there on her tail uh, along the side. So here's a nice, beautiful spring male at deep jet black, uh, beautiful uh, reddish orange uh, coloration as well. They tend to get really excited as they come down the, war, the water and they'll fan their tails out so you can really see those uh, coloration patterns really nicely. So not much to mistake this bird for, uh, at least by its coloration. So the oven bird is uh, uh, associated with this group too. Uh, very streaky vest. It almost has a, um, a thrush sort of appearance to it. That sort of olive green back with the striking distinct eye ring. So that call of teacher, 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 teacher. Here's another bird that's another uh, habitat. You would often see this bird or hear them calling uh, in uh, upper elevational, deep deciduous forest. But that teacher, teacher, teacher is, is uh, pretty constant throughout. Uh, the Louisiana water thrush, sort of swirling uh, downward call. And often with that little note on the end of it. And once again, a very clear whistle sort of downward swirling. The common yellow throat, another great um, uh, example of the warblers and just a beautiful little bird with that beautiful raccoon face patch there, uh, deep yellow throat on him, the white edging his face patch. Very uh, easy call to learn, very consistent, uh, very even. Witchety, witchety, witchety. So the most of the variants with this bird are just the, um, uh, how long he goes on with the witcheties <laughs> that he adds or subtracts from it, but almost very consistent um, uh, throughout. And it's another very um, sort of flat tone. Uh, their chip notes are also very distinct. This is a fall bird here. And here's a nice spring bird, uh, nice male. So these like a bit more of the uh, open scrubby areas, typically where you find these, often uh, near water uh, sources. So almost every spring, I think ever since I've had uh, uh, the bird spa in the backyard there, I've had at least one, typically we get uh, 
more like three on average, I would guess. Often hearing them call before they come in. So they kind of give us a little uh, advance notice, which is nice. Once again, notice he's not drinking at all. He's just uh, taking care of his feathers. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed looking at these, um, this beautiful group of birds here too. I hope it'll inspire you to uh, maybe listen to your um, uh, audios a little bit to study up uh, your ears as uh, these birds get ready to uh, come into the area in just a little while here. It's always, for me, such an exciting time of year uh, to those two weeks, especially when we get the high density. Uh, people always ask me about my camera equipment. I'm a Canon guy, I'm shooting a 5D Mark III body still. Uh, I think I've got over a million actuations on that camera. I don't, can't believe it hadn't blown up. Uh, most of these were shot with either a 400 millimeter prime lens or a 600 millimeter F4 um, uh, that I've had for a few years now. But really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, my passion uh, for nature uh, and um, uh, glad to see, you know, everyone's doing um, so well and, um, you know, get uh, get your ears ready because uh, these birds are coming. Uh, one of my first um, uh, big pandemic projects was um, uh, rebuilding my website. Uh, it now has uh, over 200 species galleries, most of which are birds or some mammal galleries in there too. But if you have a favorite species, you can go right to that page and you'll find my uh, favorites uh, in there too. I'm also regularly at um, exhibitions at art shows and festivals uh, all throughout the mid-Atlantic. Uh, and the images on my website are also available as uh, fine art prints as well. And uh, I do have uh, instructions on how to build um, the bird spa uh, is available on my website as well. Uh, I think I'm down to only one calendar um, left. So those are just about done uh, for this year. I also have other things on there. You'll find the note cards, uh, Christmas cards this year were one of my favorites ever. And if you belong to other groups that uh, may need nature-based um, uh, lectures and programs, um, uh, send along my contact information. I'm always uh, looking for new groups to connect with and stuff and uh, um, share everything. So um, thank you all for um, having me out and uh, I really do uh, appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's always a joy for me to, uh, to share. I got to uh, share at my old hometown quote unquote bird club uh, Wednesday night in Lynchburg and uh, which is it's always deja vu going in there because they're still in the, meeting in the same room at uh, what used to be Randolph making women's college is now just Randolph college but we still meet in the same room on the third floor as we used to uh, back in the mid 70s when the bird club ladies would drag me around as a kid and um, you know it's clubs like yours that uh, inspired me in my youth they scholarship me off to nature camp a couple of summers and uh, things like that. So uh, it really has been a joy. And um, I, like I said, really uh, am looking forward to the spring birds coming in. Um, Do anyone have any questions? I think that's almost all I know about warblers. So I hope there's not too much, but if you do, uh, you're welcome to, to ask and I'll do my best. Beautiful presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, John. Good to see you, sweetie. Can you tell me something about your bird bath? Um, sure, it's, um, I guess the first one of these I built in, when I was still in Bedford County in 2006, I think it was. And um, it basically, I, I had seen this, I had a very small space to put a water feature in there because I, I wanted to have a bird bath. And the only thing I knew of prior to that was just to go get the one on the pedestal. It's concrete, you know, you get at the hardware store. And, um, but I had seen this rock down in my creek bed when I had, when I was in Bedford County, that was a couple feet across with a, but it had just a beautiful bowl shape to it. And because I wanted to do photography at it, I wanted something that looked natural. Uh, so my brother and I, and a 20 foot chain and his Land Cruiser drug that, 350 pound rock out of the creek bed. It was about six inches thick and uh, suspended it over. So I, I took a plastic storage box that probably holds around 20 gallons of water and put a goldfish pond pump in it. 
and suspended the rock over top of that with a couple pieces of rebar. Uh, and so the water got pumped up onto it and it would just spill back over and go back into a hole that I cut in the top of the box um, with some screening on it to keep the mosquitoes out. And all of a sudden, I mean, almost like in like within days, there was, you know, in those days I was near the mountains, had like purple finches. It was uh, uh, early, early, like late winter, really. Uh, when I first put it in, I had cedar wax wings come up at it within just a couple of weeks showed up and was one of my first uh, favorite pictures that I ever took. But the behavior of the birds was just so defining that they were at the water. One was drinking and one sitting up watching and uh, I had to have goldfinches and just all kinds of birds just almost immediately come into it. And so when I moved to Richmond, I put another one in here. Uh, it was actually a guy in the Richmond Audubon who told me about the dripping water thing. And, uh, you know, it didn't really sound all that plausible <laughs> at the time, but I was like, well, I'll give it a try. So I, I took a milk jug and filled it with water and put a little pinprick in it on a shepherd's cane and let it drip into my bird bath. And sure enough, and, you know, during migration, all of a sudden I had a beautiful male, black throated blue, um, sitting in my backyard at the bird bath, you know, so I um, added a second valve into the plumbing that comes off the pond pump. Uh, that's already in the system so that it just drips all the time now and um, but it's you know the whole one of the primary purposes of it was to eliminate all the maintenance because when I put my first the bird bath out there the one from the hardware store I had to go out every day and it was full of poop and mosquitoes and or it just dried up completely and was gross you know and it was like an everyday maintenance thing and um, so when I did this one uh, the way I did it, it was like, I mean, three, four, five weeks would go by and I didn't have to do anything at all to it. And uh, the, the dripper is actually even added to the minimal maintenance to it because the dripping keeps the surface of it wet. And because the birds use it so much, you do get the occasional fecal matter on there. And because the surface is wet, I just keep a little like vegetable brush. And literally you could take a like a water sprinkler for your flowers and just drip it over it with that minimal amount of water and it just rinses the top uh, off quite easily. And, uh, but the way it brings the warblers in is just incredible. So, yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's been a crazy amount of fun. Actually, I just had, um, uh, if you, I don't know if you're, any of y'all are also Audubon members um, uh, on the, I submitted a video of some cedar wax wings I took last year into their uh, national photography competition. They had a video category for the first time uh, of the cedar of a cedar waxwing flock coming into the bird bath. Uh, and it actually came in in the top 10 uh, in their uh, photography awards. It's on the national website. Uh, if you look up the video category uh, and then when the fall issue of Audubon Magazine came out without me knowing it, they pulled a picture out of my video to announce the, the uh, posting uh, of the video. So that was kind of a bucket list, you know, uh, thing, a little Bobby Scammerhorn from Lynchburg, you know, to, uh, to get a picture published in the National Audubon magazine. So it was like just crazy, you know, a uh, really cool, fun thing. But the video is beautiful. It's on my website um, as well, which I did post uh, in the chat uh, is a link to my uh, website. If you look on there, there's a link that shows the full uh, length video, the one on the Audubon uh, national website is I think we only were allowed 30 seconds so you had to make it a good 30 seconds but it was pretty incredible um, uh, opportunity to video those birds uh, and their behavior uh, which was a lot of fun how, lo how large is the the bird bath so like yeah that? so the rock is um, the rock is about um, probably maybe 18 inches across maybe about that, not it's not round, it's kind of potato shape. You know? uh, it's maybe two and a half to three inches thick. Uh, the one I have here in Richmond, the one that was in Bedford, which is way too heavy to even consider moving it. It was beautiful uh, stone because it was one big bowl shape. Uh, but this one's smaller um, just because it's, if I do ever have to get inside of it, the, the system really does better if you don't open it up because it has a filter box and it kind of acts like a probiotic in your gut, you know, that, that uh, processes any uh, organic matter 
uh, that falls into it. And um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's about two feet across, maybe 18 inches, something like that. Uh, and then the, the little bowl shape in the middle um, is really, if you think about it, like if you took a Frisbee and turned it upside down, it's about an inch deep and about, you know, as big round as a dinner plate um, where they come into it. And um, the storage box under it is just, you know, your basic thing. You probably fit, you know, half a dozen beach towels in it or something around 20 gallon size. Thank you. It is quite uh, enjoyable to watch them in what looked like a very, very natural environment. Yeah, it sure looks like it does. <laughs> but I'm in, you know, I'm in a third of an acre lot with a thousand other a third of an acre lots all surrounding me on the, you know, uh, north side grid of suburbia uh, in the state capital, and you know that's uh, uh, every day goes by. There's you know another tree disappearing out of what's left of the canopy to start with. You know, so it's for, uh, I, I have a program I do that's nothing, but um, uh, I did it for the Williamsburg Bird Club. Uh, I think last year. Uh, that's nothing, but it's all about the bird bath. It shows you how to build it and uh, all the parts to it and everything, and all the birds that have come to it. I've had. 83 species. I've had a new species every year and I don't count them until they touch the, the rock and uh, they can't just approach it. You know, they got to make full contact. And uh, I've had like three species of hogs. I must, uh, I mean, there's not many left. Every year I've had one new species at least. Um, last year was a fox sparrow, which was just incredible. Uh, he hung out for a couple of weeks and stuff too. And he was like right at like mid-December. I was like, oh man, I'm going to make it through. It's going to break my uh, running record of not getting a new species. And this fox bear showed up in the middle of uh, the cold of December last year and hung out for a while. And I got some great shots of him. Uh, last spring, we also had the, the Cape May pictures were from last spring. Uh, we had chest, two chestnut-sided males. I've had females occasionally too. And, uh, and then, oh yeah, I had a, I, once before I had an indigo bunny, uh, but this past spring I had a male come and I got, the first time he came, I didn't get shot any photographs of him at all, but this time I got some spectacular um, uh, shots of a beautiful spring male standing there on the front of the bath. We get gross beaks, you know, and stuff and other, all the other stuff too. Every thrush, I think uh, pretty much I've had on there as well. So it's been, been a lot do you of have a Do you have a diagram, Bob, of it? Yeah, there's actually, there's a book on my website. It's in, if you go into the store um, okay. tab, it's called The Bird Spa. Um, I have a friend in Goochland who I always have to give credit for because uh, she put one in just outside of her little bay window where she sits and has tea in the morning and watches the birds. And um, she kept calling hers her bird spa. <laughs> And stuff too. So it's like, you gotta let me use that term. It's like the perfect description, you know, uh, of what it is because it's got the running water and stuff. And here, because, you know, we get, you know, five, six days where it's like, seems like it barely reaches 20 degrees, you know, once a year in January or February. Uh, it seems like every year. And so I, it also has a de icer in it, uh, which keeps the water from freezing. Um, too. I don't know that you guys have that problem in San Diego. I don't need that in San Diego, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that part you can leave off. That'll save you, you know, about 75 bucks there. Um, <laughs> but the first winter I put mine in, it froze. And um, uh, after, you know, it was like after a long run, because the rest of it is running. And typically that part's fine. Um, but after about five days, uh, that even gives out. And um, I will check it out. Thank, thank you so much. The presentation was wonderful. Oh, well, everything you. about it. Thank you for letting me join you all again uh, this evening. Yeah, appreciate it. So if there isn't any more questions, Bob, I hope you saw the wonderful comments that you received within the chat. Oh, I, didn't. I hadn't even been looking over there. Um, so it was all Thank beautiful all. and yeah. informative and just a praise for you all around so but I oh, want to make sure you sure. recognize that because it's good to be congratulated on wonderful work yeah it makes all the mud and mosquito bites worth it so yeah I do appreciate it for sure and I love your um uh, uh doing your uh ID stuff with your ducks and stuff I knew that blue wing teal immediately it's uh as a photographer I've, I've uh, it's always interesting the different um uh 
uh, patterns on those small little feathers around the different ducks' bodies. The gadwalls are very much like a scale because they have sort of an even black around the tip with a brown right underneath it that's almost a, a loop stripe around the outer perimeter and a half circle uh, and stuff. So it's, um, you know, I know the blue wings have kind of go from that to a sort of spotty, almost perfectly round dot uh, as well. So it's quite interesting to see that. Um, yeah, and I guess if enjoy. you're not a fly fisher person, um, you don't always pay attention to those finer details of feathers. That I have a friend who's a fly fisher who's really ah. crazy about feathers and stuff. So, very but, interesting. Yeah, but thank you again on behalf of the club. It's been a wonderful evening. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their March. Perhaps I'll see you out and about and keep your eyes to the sky. So we have some things to share next month. Again, wonderful presentation, Bob. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a Yay, safe day. Hey, Bob. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. It was lovely. Good night, y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. <laughs>